I think this, this page very nicely summarizes quantum machine learning in a nutshell. So you will start very similarly in classical machine learning, but you start with data the first step is to figure out how to encode this data into a quantum state, right? How do you actually load this data onto your quantum computer so you can use it once you do that? Then the next step is to process the data on the quantum computer so we apply some sort of model and then the last step, of course, is to measure your quantum system. You apply some sort of measurement and this will give you then some classical information which you need to interpret as a label or a prediction and this is, this is basically the idea, right? It's a very similar framework to a classical machine learning algorithm with an exception of the measurement quantum neural networks okay so if we had to go back to the circuit notation and this this picture here and recently this it's been very popular to try and understand this idea of quantum neural networks can we actually create a quantum version of a classical neural network which i showed you earlier and spoiler alert i don't think we can create a a direct analogy and i'll show you why so let's say we've got some quantum system here and oh, oh, qubits. These are all qubits, right? I initialize, let's say. In. The ground state, so they're all initialized to zero. So remember this. This state here can be thought of as just a very long vector, right? A very long ket vector, and usually in quantum machine learning. In these quantum neural networks, the first step, of course, is then to figure out how to encode your data, right? So this... Mm. Ux over here is um is basically you can think of it as a very very large matrix or a tensor product of smaller matrices acting on individual qubits and this matrix or this operation here this unitary operator it depends on your data so x is your data it depends on your data what does that mean it means that when you apply operations to these qubits you often rotate them in different angles right and if these angles depend on the values of your data, then you are, in a sense, encoding your data information into the rotation values of these qubits of your system music. So this is how you, you, you would um, encode the information that you have into a quantum model, into a quantum circuit, and I'll show you an example of that just now. The next step, like we mentioned, is um, to apply some sort of model, right? Some sort of process so we can Apply another set of operations, I just call them W theta, so another set of unitary operations, but this time, instead of the rotations or the operations depending on your data, it can depend on some parameters, let's say, we call them like theta one, like a vector of parameters, right, so, um, we can rotate the qubits or manipulate them about angles that depend on some parameters, which we can train and optimize, and so this is very similar to like a neural network, right, because, um, we have a data vector, usually in a neural network, and then we apply a weight matrix to that data vector. And that weight matrix is trained and optimized, and in this setting, we can kind of do the same, we can pick parameters. For this, these operations, and um, if we wanted to add another block, we could do that easily. Right, and add some more parameters here that we train and optimize, but the difference between a classical neural network and a quantum model or quantum neural network is... Um, the dynamics are inherently linear. The, um, you know, the, uh, as a function of quantum mechanics, everything that happens here has to be linear, right? Or else we violate some, some fundamental properties of physics, and so we can't inject these nonlinear functions in A in A in a qubit system in, in this kind of model here. And this is really bad, right? One would think, because this nonlinearity gives us the power and classical machine learning to have these, these really great universal functions. Approximata models, right, so um, there are some suggestions on how to inject these non-linearities into these quantum models. I've put up some papers after this, but I want to also point out that actually a source of non-linearity in a quantum model can actually come from your measurement strategy. So your measurement introduces non-linearities, and the reason is very clear in the mathematics. So um, if you're uncomfortable with this, with this diagram, just remember that this is a vector. These are matrices, and then the measurement is actually, you can think of it as like um, a vector and a vector and a vector transpose that, like kind of squash uh, a matrix in the middle, so if you, if you pick up any quantum. Computing textbook and look at the formula of the measurement, you immediately see why this is a non-linear operation that happens okay, and then once you measure your system, then um, of course you get classical. 
information and the last step is to just figure out how to manipulate this classical information such that you have a prediction or a label for your machine learning task and this is an overview of of um of the framework of of machine learning models right and this is also sometimes referred to as a variational classifier it's a quantum neural network or a variational classifier because it's a variational model it depends on parameters and it does classification tasks typically and how it's normally displayed is like this is just combined as one operation that depends on some parameters and if this was a little bit fast or confusing then i suggest um we also did a very in-depth four series four part series lecture on explaining each of these blocks mm, in a lecture each and you just digging a little bit into why we should choose certain data encoding strategies, certain variational models, and certain measurement strategies for a quantum. Machine learning tasks. So this is a link that, if you're interested, you can, you can go check out. And here are some papers that I mentioned about other quantum neural networks that people try to, to introduce to, to create new things, more powerful models, and inject non-linearities into things and stuff like that. So if you're also interested... Um, some of these models or some of these papers are, I think, quite cool. And by the way, that I just want to also highlight the, the field of quantum. Machine learning is so fast paced that, for example, this mode, this paper here came out up training deep quantum new networks and nature communications. And they argue that quantum neural networks, or so these ones, that they propose are really good. They're really um, easy to train. They perform very well. But then I think maybe a month later, a paper came out that disproved all their claims because they showed that these models actually have a very bad loss landscape. So you often want to find when it mentioned this loss of this cost function, you want to find the minimum of this cost function. But if this cost function is very, very flat, it's very hard to find the minimum, right? Because it's just flat everywhere. And so it's really hard to train this model because the gradients don't give you any information anymore. This is something called a barren plateau problem and this is something that's quite common in, in quantum machine learning which you'll hear of so this model actually falls into this barren plateau problem where the cost landscape becomes flat and you can't train it anymore okay let's see how much time i have okay good i just want to take you um very quickly through some of these sub encoding data components that i mentioned so i glossed over them very quickly and didn't really show you how you would actually go about doing this right. So let's look at the first step of encoding your data, the first blocks, getting your new information into a quantum circuit. So let's start off with a very trivial angle encoding. Example, let's say that we have a data point and this data point is just a two-dimensional vector, right? So it's a vector with two entries and one of the encoding strategies in quantum machine learning that's that's often used is something called angle encoding and it's very intuitive how how it works it is depending on the structure of your data so in this case our data is two-dimensional then you pick a number of qubits that's equal to the dimension of your data so in this case we just need two qubits in our system to encode this data point and how do we do that we apply header mark gates to each of them. these qubits so how to gates are operations that you probably are familiar with that basically just put your qubits into superposition so once these qubits are into are in superposition we apply rotations to them and in the case of angle angle encoding you apply um let's say for example z rotations so you rotate each qubit about the z axis and the angle at which you rotate them depends on your data so the first qubit will rotate it about the z axis um about an angle that's equal to the first value in our data point the first feature value and the second qubit will rotate it also around them. Z, axis, and this time, the rotation will depend on the second feature value of the data point. So this is the idea of angle encoding, and the names is quite straightforward as well, right? You literally encode your data in angles of rotations for each qubit, and if we had a higher dimensional data. Point, for example, now we've, we've got, you know, three entries here, then we simply add another qubit to the system. And we do the same kind of rotation. This is obviously a very trivial way to do it. And there are other ways to encode your information into, into quantum states, but this is just something I wanted to show you an example, all right? Applying a model. So now let's say, um, let's say we do angle encoding right as our first step to get our data in. Then what models do we apply? 
what operations do we do here that depend on, on these parameters, Theta? And there is a lot, a lot, a lot of literature trying to figure out exactly this question. Mm. And this is a very nice paper over here trying to understand how expressive certain models are that we can apply in. That variation or component write that component that depends on parameters. Um, so there are lots of different combinations that have been tested and different rotations and different, different, we call them ANZACs. Uh, just a framework for uh, a circuit right, and so if you have time, I encourage you. To read this paper, it's, it basically talks about certain operations that you can apply that allow your model to cover the full. Gilbert space to cover the full computational space of your qubit systems, this is very nice. So one that I want to show you is one that's actually quite hardware friendly. So if you're coding up some quantum models, you'll see this kind of variational model already pre-coded in Penny Lane, which you'll see later with Thomas Umin Kiskit, which is IBM's quantum computing framework. So this is, this is something called um, the real amplitude model in the Kiskit framework, if you're interested. So how it looks is um, you apply some data encoding strategy, right, which we discussed. And then the variational part consists of rotations again on each qubit. So this Time, I just assume, let's say we've got four qubits in the model, and this time the rotations are about the I axis. So this is a different axis, right? And this time the rotations depend on angles that are parameterized, so they're actually parameter in our model that we can tweak and we can change. So, for example, the first qubit, we rotate it around the I axis about an angle equal to theta 1, and then this. This model does a little bit something more right. It does it adds these entanglement blocks. So this is creating, these are C0 gates, and this is creating entanglement between your, between your qubits. So these will hopefully introduce some non-classical correlations that somehow give us higher expressibility than perhaps a classical model would, and then we can add some more rotations and some more parameters in our model. And if we want to increase even more parameters in our model, we can repeat this block and as many times as we want. So this is an example of, of this kind of variational structure. And now the last block, the measurement, extracting a label. Now the measurement is, um, is a little bit tricky to understand, I think, in, in general. So I want to, I want to, um, I want to just show you the most common strategy that's used in classical. Machine learning, I'm sorry, in quantum machine learning. And then if you are interested in, um, in, um, in understanding a little bit deeper, why? then I would encourage you to read a little bit more of the literature. So what is typically done in quantum? Machine learning models is actually quite simple. Um, they ignore the other qubits and usually just measure one, we measure one qubit and we get statistics out of this qubit. Right, so for example, um, let's say we measure this first qubit and this first qubit can either be in state zero or state one right. But remember, this is not a deterministic model. So we had repeat this experiment over. And over, until we get some expectation values, we get some statistics of how likely is it to be in state zero and how likely is it to be in state one. So we'll get a probability distribution over this, over this qubit, over the possible states it can be in. And then we simply take this probability distribution and map it to a prediction, right? So let's say we get a probability distribution that gives up 70 of the time the qubit is in state one and 30% of the time it's in zero. Then we can say that, um, the problem, the probability, it's more, it's more probable. To belong to class 1 as opposed to class 0, right, we can convert these two classes and maybe this means like that, that picture is a cat and a 70 probability that the picture is a cat. Okay, but there are more sophisticated measurement strategies, which is again something I want to mention and point out. And um, there are theoretical reasons for, for why we do certain measurements and strategies, and I'll point you back to that lecture series I mentioned earlier, if you want to understand a little bit more why we do these things. Okay, so once we have um, the measurement of our system and we can convert it to a label right, we've got a prediction now for our quantum machine learning model. And if we have a label or prediction, then we can plug it into a cost function. We can plug it into a cost function that will check it against the true outcome, the true label for the, for the data point. And so if we can do that, then we can start to use classical optimization techniques like gradient descent, which I mentioned earlier, which is really, really nice, right? Because we don't have to worry about reinventing the wheel and um, trying to figure out how to optimize these quantum circuits. 
We can already borrow from classical machine learning techniques and do things like gradient descent, and these are already pre-coded very nicely in Inoptimizes in on quantum software frameworks like Qiskit, for example. So it put this snapshot of this piece of code here. Penny Lane has it as well, of course, and and many others. Okay, so if we go back then, this um this picture of uh quantum learning, which I put up in the beginning, what we have done is we basically discussed each of these components, right? So we've got some data which we can represent as a vector. We figure out how to encode this data. So I showed you one method that's simply encoding the vector values in angles um, in each qubit. Rotating each qubit about angles that are equal to the data values then by processing, we apply this. Variational model. I showed you one example that consists